All right, we're live, we're recording. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the beginning of our 40 days of prayer journey here with Kit Cummings. And uh, we got the Pittsburgh Church on the call. We've got the Nittany Valley Church or the Nittany Church there from State College on the call and the Frederick Church all here. It's great to see you guys partying over there in State College, meeting in a small group, family group. That's awesome. Um, so cool to see uh, some people I know and to see some people I don't know on the call. Thank you guys for joining. I'm so excited to dive into prayer. Um, you know, on Sunday, uh, we got to hear Kit Cummings speak uh, virtually. Glad to hear that the uh, the doctor's report was, was favorable, Kit. We were praying for you. Um, but, but on Sunday, it was uh, really um, inspiring. I think the thing that stood out to me um, and, and for those that haven't seen it, I'll, I'll send out the, the link here soon. Uh, but just the reminder that uh, Satan is far less powerful than we give him. Or we give him way too much credit, way too much power in our lives. And uh, this idea that we really are on the winning side with God and, and that uh, we can, we have every reason to trust him. And sometimes the curses are really blessings and vice versa. Ending on that story was really powerful as well. But I'm excited just to uh, to get real together in prayer. Uh, I've I've been getting up. I'll share a quick story and then introduce Kit and we'll get started. But uh, if you haven't gotten the book, uh, you can grab the book on IPI Books or at least in Pittsburgh, we're selling it uh, after church on Sundays. Go ahead and grab it. One of the challenges is first thing in the morning to get on your knees and start praying. And that's been so good for me to roll out of bed. It helps me get out of bed, one, and then two, and start praying. Um, I'm still mildly quarantined in our house. I've been sleeping upstairs and Elena's downstairs. And this morning I got up pretty early and I usually get up before Elena, but I came into our living room or in our living room, our bedroom downstairs, and uh, it was still dark, but the bed was made and I was confused. And I, I heard a voice. I looked over and Elena was on the ground already praying. She'd already gotten up and, and had started praying. So she scared me a little bit, but also inspired me. So uh, I encourage you to get, get it started, get on, on your knees first thing in the morning and start praying. I'm really excited to have uh, Kit coming speak tonight and take us on this journey, 40 days of prayer. Um, he and, and Terry are an amazing couple. They uh, live down in Atlanta, uh, specifically in Marietta, um, right on the square, uh, more or less. Uh, but they're uh, an amazing couple. Kit's uh, an amazing man of God. Uh, he shared a lot of his story uh, the other day in the lesson, but uh, want to share uh, a few things specifically. Kit's an author and a teacher who has had impact all over the world through his ministry, The Power of Peace Project. Uh, he's applied his principles to bring about change in prisons, in schools, and juvenile courts, and in faith-based communities. In fact, Kit was recognized by the NAACP back in 2020 on Martin Luther King Day, and he was awarded the Living the Dream Award for his work uh, in the prison system, his work in uh, the community as well. Kit has written six books, and... Uh, um, one of them, most of us already have and have started reading, Power of Prayer, and excited to dive into that in this series that he's done with many other churches and really uh, came highly recommended from multiple ministers, multiple uh, disciples just recommended getting, uh, getting, diving into prayer together with Kit. Um, you know, I've already been impacted by Kit's example of faith and vulnerability, uncensored, and uh, his commitment to prayer as well. And um, what we're going to do, just a little bit of housekeeping for this group, is every uh, for the next six weeks, every midweek, uh, we'll be together at 7 p.m. We'll use the same link. Um, the various church leaders have it. If you ever can't find the link, you can go to pittsburghchurch.org under the events tab, where uh, you see it, there's a link for midweek. You can go right to that website and click on it. It's always open and ready for people to join. And uh, yeah, we'll be together here. And if anyone misses it or wants to share it, uh, we are recording and we will post to Facebook, at least on the Pittsburgh Church Facebook, or not Facebook, YouTube page. And we'll get that information uh, out to the church leaders as well to distribute um, the recordings. So excited to go on this journey, excited to dive into prayer and see what God's going to do. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our, our guest speaker here, to the man of the hour to keep coming. So I'll pass it over and, and spotlight your screen, Kit. All right. Thank you so much, James and uh, Elena, uh, who I have not gotten to meet yet. 
Um, I've been, it seems like it was, I don't know how many months ago that we started talking about this, James, but it's been a minute and I've been looking forward to it. And um, also grateful. Thank you for the prayers. You know, just as one of those times where you're trying to figure a few things out. And so, you know, with my, you know, that that is what it is. And I know everybody's going through some things. So it always, it means a lot that you guys were praying for me before I even got to meet you. So thank you for that. And uh, I also think that Jameson Malcolm is out there somewhere. Is he on this thing? Like, like we go back all the way to Athens when he, <laughs> he's a little dude. <laughs> like, I, I don't know how, J Jameson, where you at? How old were you when I met you, bro? He's muted. Well, anyway, he was a little dude. And then I think we came across each other in Philadelphia, maybe at a college thing. I can't remember where it was, but um, but anyway, it's great to see you again, bro. And um, also my wonderful, beautiful wife yeah, is I, on the line. And so I want yeah, to- Yeah, I know. I, sorry, I was having to get enough mute. How old were you when I met you, man? He's on mute. <laughs> I was at single digits, man. I was probably like nine years old, something like single that. Single digits, man. That's a trip. Let's and I remember it. some of those crazy stories you were telling, too. You came with a reputation. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't, don't even mind. I shudder to think about what I was talking about back then, bro. <laughs> it's another day in time. But anyway, let me introduce Terry, my wife. She's down there in the, the bottom screen. Say, hey, baby. Hi, everybody. Or I'm supposed to say, hey, baby. That's what he told me to say, <laughs> was, hey, baby. <laughs> or you can say, hey, y'all. That works. Hey, y'all. Yeah. yeah. That, that's more like it, right? The y'all. That's right. I married me a Southern belle down here in the South. Um, but anyway, thank you. Uh, I said it on Sunday, but I want to say it again. It's like, it's a big deal when a preacher gives up his pulpit, you know, for six weeks or, you know, whatever we got coming. And um, it means a lot because... You know, we talked on the phone and and immediately you just decided to trust me, you know what I'm saying? And you're in charge. And same with uh, Jameson and uh, what other leaders are on the line is, is I know that you're in charge of, of leading your group, protecting them and teaching them. So I just want to let you know, I don't take this lightly. Um, every one of these is absolutely different. It's not plug and play like, where it's just kind of like going through the same notes. It's not. It's very spirit driven i leave a whole lot of room you know for the spirit to do what he does and um and that makes this thing so unique because the every family is different we share things in common as far as convictions and things we believe but every congregation every group um has their own flair their own kind of family style and their own little nuances and after we spend <clears throat> this time together in the coming weeks I'll just tell you now, but tell me if I'm I'm right by the end of it, is we're going to develop this really cool bond because, you know, we're going to laugh a little bit. If you know me, I'm going to cry a little bit. <laughs> Don't even get worried about me. It is how I am. You know what I'm saying? I, I kind of, I feel things very strongly and I'm passionate about what I believe. And so um, it's going to be a very, very good, wonderful time. And I'm praying, um, brother, I want to do my best for you. I've prayed for that. And I really want this to, to leave a mark. And I think the places where we've gotten to do this, it really is kind of a, I don't know, it's different perspectives. And I want to, I want to share that this is my perspective. This is my journey. These are my convictions. Some of them, you know, in certain areas will be opinions. I want to say that because I want you to borrow whatever you like and give back whatever you don't try it. I'm going to ask you to try this process, which is going to be a little bit different and you might wonder, like, well, where does it come from? Well, it's all biblically based, but it comes from a time in my life when I was searching for answers when everything had fallen apart. And I gave you guys, those that were able to see the video on Sunday, um, you know, wild guy went into the ministry, shocked the world, found out I had a little bit of talent, was good at growing churches. And then after doing it 15 years, just burnt out, fell out and was out there just trying to figure out what in the heck just happened. And I don't know if anybody's been through that. Um, we've seen people leave. We've seen people return. Um, but my journey has been, you know, unique to me. And so the things I'm going to share come from experience. There's going to be scriptures that you that you know and love. And there might be, a, I might shed a little light on some scriptures that might help you see it a different way. Um, but I want to let you know that, that this is something you've got to wrestle with. So I'm just going to give you some ideas. Because what I did is I did not set out to write a book on prayer. 
I mean, we've got tons and tons of great stuff out there on prayer, better than what I could write. What I did was I, I came up with a journal for myself because I basically had to figure out how do I rebuild what was shattered? And really, to tell you the truth, there were certain things in my foundation that were faulty. And you know how the Bible says that the fire will test the quality of our faith. Well, it did for me. And there was there was some holes, there was some gaps in the wall. And I had to figure out, you know, what happened and how does this work? And so this is basically the product of a journey that I went on trying to discover God and to find miracles in my life, because that's what I needed. And there's people on this call that are in many different places in your life right now. We've all got, you know, as I said on Sunday, storms, you know, come into our life. And it's just because of this human existence is part of it. And it comes in, and, you know, the storm sometimes a minute, sometimes they blow through quickly. Um, I ask everybody to mute if they could. That'd be awesome. Everybody check their mute. Thank you. There you go. Everybody good? Maybe the... All right. There we go. Thank you. Um, so anyway, this is this is basically a product of, of years kind of putting it together. And then I decided I would just share it. And so I published it back in 2013. It did, I don't know, a little bit here and there. Little churches might pop up and do it, but I had never taught it before. It was just my process of how I live. And then in 2020, on March the 12th, when our governor told us to go and, you know, get two weeks worth of groceries, and we didn't know it was going to be two years, um, I was, you know, my whole thing is live, you know, whether it's preaching in churches, doing corporate events, you know, teaching in prisons and schools, you know, doing what I do is all very live. And that's how, you know, we make our, our income and support our family. And all of a sudden it was just gone. And two things I prayed, I remember laying in bed, it was that night, March the 12th, Terry was already asleeping. I'm just laying in bed and I'm praying and I'm like, what do you want me to do? And I got two things very clearly. And this whole process, I hope, is going to introduce you to some aspects of the Holy Spirit that maybe you haven't experienced. And because when I was out there, you know, I had to, I had to get to know him. And I had to, when I say experience him, I'm not talking about, you know, wild kind of crazy things or feelings or I'm talking about a knowing, you know, I needed him for the first time in my life. I hate to say it. But all those years in the ministry leading churches, I thought that I understood him and I thought I relied on him. But really, you know, it turns out, I don't know about y'all, but we had a system that we kind of relied on. And, and I don't know, I didn't I didn't know it, but I wasn't really utilizing the power that God promises us. So I'm laying there in bed and I said, what do you want to do? And he told me two things. Uh, this, this is what I kind of perceive is preach 40 sermons in 40 days during the quarantine. Now, that one was like, kind of like it was just a, an idea, but it was strong. And I'm like, man, I need to preach 40 days in a row. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever tried that, but I certainly had. And I'm talking about live on Facebook. So I got on there and that night before I chickened out, I posted it on my Facebook and I said, join me live tomorrow for the first sermon of 40 sermons in 40 days. And I got up the next day and I was like, oh my gosh, what have I done? About 11 days in, man, I was about, you know, I mean, it was... It was challenging because every morning was a 30 minute sermon and I had to dig deep and it was so good for me. And it turns out that it helped some people too get through this weird thing we were going through. So that was one and I did it and I successfully completed it. The other one was re-release this book because people need it now. And so I went to my publisher and kind of revamped it and changed some things, added some things to the version you got. And I had one church in Atlanta, buddy of mine, and uh I don't know how it happened, but we were talking and I said, hey, man, do you need midweek content? And he's like, yeah, because there's a lot of preachers that hadn't done preaching. We didn't have Zoom. I mean, maybe we had it, we weren't using it, but we weren't necessarily used to preaching on camera. Well, I've done a whole lot of that. And so I was like, man, if you need anything, I've got this idea. And I said, um, how about if I lead, you know, we'll, we'll six or seven weeks, I'll do your midweeks and I'll teach this 40 days of prayer. And, you know, it was, I don't know if it was, I don't remember it being great, but it was a kind of a leap. And then he told a brother in South Africa, 
And I had done a tour down there, you know, years before in 2012. And so I kind of was connected to some brothers down there, but really I went down there to be a part of the Gandhi Global Peace Summit. I got to speak at it. It was a fascinating trip. And anyway, so he said, hey, do you know this guy? He's like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And he said, man, we just did this thing. You ought to do it. And so I ended up in a short period of time because of the time change. Noon here is seven o'clock there. And so I ended up doing um, Soweto, Joburg, Cape Town, Durban, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe. It was like eight or 10 churches down there. And I would preach on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at noon. And it was incredible. And something just happened. I got caught up in it. I got connected to these brothers and sisters down there that are so beautiful. And it started this thing. And then all of a sudden it jumped to Paraguay and then it jumped and then it just started kind of spreading. And I've never marketed it. We're about to start marketing it. And it just hopped around from Tucson to DC, down to Charleston, out to LA, three different regions in LA, Houston, Dallas, you know, all these churches. And it just kind of became this, this prayer wave. And I'm praying that it, that it can continue. Because I think we're living in a day and age, at least I am, where life is different than it's ever been. It might be because we're empty nesters now. We have grandsons now. You know, we've come a long way in the 18 years of our relationship, Terry and I. And life just squeezes us. I mean, it's the state of the world. It's the division in our country, whether it's politically, religiously, gender, economics, race. I mean, we're a divided world and the economy is all jacked up and people are filled with fear. And I shoot, I understand what that feels like. And, you know, sometimes it's a health concern. Sometimes it's a marriage, you know, that's on the rocks. It could be you know, financial crisis, it could be whatever, when your kids are struggling, good Lord, I mean, that really tests us. And I'm going to share very openly about some of the things we've experienced with our 20 something, not 20 something kids, we don't have 20 something kids, we have kids that are 20 somethings. And so make sure that's how rumors get started. And so anyway, here's what I want to do. Now it's come to, to you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the process. And then I'm going to dig into the scripture for tonight. And then I'm going to show you the evidence of what is possible. And so instead of just teaching some things I learned through study, I'm going to teach from experience. And then at the end, I'm going to show you some pictures of what God did with this one idea and kind of where it is today. And hopefully it'll encourage you to dream bigger. I think we're living at a time where the world is beating the dreams out of us. And a lot of my work involves teaching young people how to dream, how to build a dream, how to manifest it, how to design it, how to protect it, because there's so few dreamers. And I think that, you know, the longer we do this thing, it ain't easy trying to follow him in a world that's rejecting a lot of faith. And, you know, maybe there's somebody out there that's beat up a little bit from it. And if so, I feel you. We're going to take, I'm going to call this a miracle journey. And we're going to take that word miracle and we're going to change the energy of it because I used to think, you know, miracles are the sun standing still for Joshua or Lazarus coming out of the grave or the, you know, the, the widow's son rising in the funeral procession. And those are bona fide miracles that when, when God gets involved in human affairs, when he intervenes, Einstein said, and I love Alvin Einstein, I studied him a lot. He said, everything is a miracle or nothing is. I choose the former. Now think about that. Either everything is a miracle that God is working around us, in us, through us, right next to us, over us, under us, or he's not working at all. And there's a lot of people that think the age of miracles have passed. I chose to take that word and say, when God intervenes in my life, it's miraculous. And I started praying for signs. And that changed everything when I started saying, show me. And it's like the scales fell off of my eyes and I started to dream bigger dreams and I began to write down my prayers and I began to stretch him. I mean, <laughs> if that's possible, really, I was stretching me, but it just kind of developed a momentum where, man, I just saw this miracle happen. Now I'm going to up it. And I'm going to say, Lord, and it just became this, you know, I called them impossible prayers. Now, hopefully you've gotten your book by now. If not, then you can just kind of take notes until it arrives. If you've, you know, I'm going to encourage everybody, if possible, don't share a book. 
This is a personal journey. And there might be some couples out there that, you know, let's just buy one and that's fine. But I'm going to tell you, if you want the maximum bang for the buck, if you want this thing to do what it can do, then you need your own journal. You could share the book, the content, but you got to have a journal where you can talk to God. I'm also going to encourage you to, uh, this is kind of a selfish project and that's not a good word, you know, but if you take away the negative connotation, I want this journey to be about you. I don't know if you're like me, but a lot of times my prayer life was about praying for my family and praying for my ministry and praying for my friends and praying for my parents and praying for my kids and praying for this and that. And maybe, I don't know if I felt guilty praying for me all the time or whatever, but I just didn't do as much of it. This is designed to help you break through whatever has got you jammed up, whatever obstacle, challenge, temptation, distraction, habits. We're going to be breaking habits and installing new ones. I'm going to encourage you set aside your preconceived notions and just give this thing 40 days. If it doesn't work for you, then give it back. But I've found that if you do this process, which I just borrowed from, you know, different things that I studied in the scriptures and applied it to me, if you'll do it, it can take you from a place where maybe you're, you've been doing your quiet time, same place, same time, same environment, cup of coffee, same scriptures, doing it how you do it for so long, especially those who've been around, been doing this 34 years. My prayer life had gotten so stale. I was praying about the same things. And I found that I would pray in the morning and then go out during the day and just forget about it because life happens and you start getting, it's the hustle and bustle. It's easy to forget what you even prayed about. That was what gave rise to the seven steps. Okay. Now each week I'm going to review the steps just to kind of start. I'm going to teach a lot about the brain. I'm not going to teach about him tonight. That'll probably be next week, but I call my brain uncle G. And I, I, I came up with that. I'm kind of weird like that, but ask my wife. But anyway, Uncle G did something for me. It separates me from my brain. My brain is an organ, much like a liver, a kidney, the lungs. I mean, it's an organ. And when my last breath happens and they, you know, put me in a box or an urn, everything that's in that box or that urn is not me. Would you agree? That's just the vessel, including the brain. If you're not aware, the brain is going to try to convince you that it is you and you are it. As that voice in the head talks to you all day long, he's talking to you right now. I call him Uncle G. Why? He's the original Google. You can find anything. He's the original GPS. He'll take you where you want to go, but he's the original gangster if you don't pay attention to it. So Uncle G, we're going to kind of develop that that concept. All I did was take this fascinating organ, this sophisticated technology, maybe the most sophisticated the universe has ever created through God. And we're going to start seeing it, separate yourself from it and understand that it does certain things. One is it's a learning machine. Two is it's a storyteller. It's also a a dealer and a junkie. You've got chemistry that, that affects your emotions and what you focus on expands. This brain is doing, you're getting millions of bits of information every second. Your brain is processing all of it. You've developed habits. If we didn't have habits, then we wouldn't be able to function because we'd have to learn everything new every day. So whatever we do repetitively becomes a habit. And once it becomes a habit, Uncle G moves it from the conscious back to the subconscious. And then you've got 97% of what you did today is based on subconscious habits. If you've ever been, you know, one time I was taking my son to a movie, it was a long time ago, and we were driving and we got into conversation and, you know, we were headed to the movies and there's all kind of turns and stops and lights and exits and doing what we do. I know how to get there, been there many times. And all of a sudden we pulled up at our destination and guess where I was? I wasn't at the movies. I was at Starbucks. <laughs> so I wasn't paying attention. And so Uncle G said, well, I know what he wants. And he took me to Starbucks. And it's like, that's a small little example of how he is doing things the way you've always done it. If you're trying to get to a place, any any area of life, whether it's your health, your fitness, you know, mentally, but certainly spiritually, we've got to constantly be breaking out of the box of habits and creating new ones. You can't just break a habit. You've got to replace it. 
And that's what this 40 days, 40 days is enough to break and replace habits with ones that serve you better. And you might be saying, man, my way works. I'm like, good, write a book. I mean, you know, if, if your ways do it, do it. Try this and see if it takes you doing great to doing outstanding, you know, and everywhere in between. Okay, so quickly the process. Here's what I do. In the morning, the seven steps are in the beginning of the book, okay? Each day I review the steps. And so that means that, now when I say each day, it's not like I don't ever miss a day. The process is review the steps to where they become second nature. All right. First step is I'll get on my knees first thing every morning. Now, for those that if you can't do that physically, I got a knee replaced a couple of years ago. And so I couldn't do it for a long time. So I had to change my my game. But years ago, I started that one simple practice. It changed everything. And it was I don't want you to get overwhelmed. Like you telling me I got to roll out of my bed onto my knees and have my quiet time. No, it's it's like this for me. I can't get out of bed any other way. I've been doing it this for 10 years, okay? So in the morning I get up, I roll onto my knees and it's kind of like this. Good morning, Lord. God, thank you so much for loving me. Help me be like you today. I need your help. Help me find miracles today. Amen. And then I run to the bathroom. Just like that. I don't go to the bathroom first. I don't check my phone first. I don't check in. Has anybody texted me or check in on Facebook? All those things typically happen before I'd ever get to a quiet time. And so I decided to give the first fruits of my thoughts to him. And it did amazing things. A lot of people there, what they share is, man, that was the most dramatic change in my life, was just that simple act of hitting my knees. It's, a, it's starting my day in a submissive posture and saying, please be with me today. I know he is, but help me see you today. That's this whole thing is about opening your eyes and seeing what God has been doing all around you. Second, write out your impossible prayer list. I want you to, to um, encourage you to pick the things that scare you a little bit. Okay, not not general, the more specific, the better. And that's going to scare some of y'all. It's like, man, I'm not I, I don't want to pray about that anymore. Man, I got my heart broken because I prayed that for years and it never happened. I'm going to dare you to get a broken heart. Broken hearts are going to come. I'd rather get it chasing my miracles than just to grow cold over time. And that's what this does for me. Write down the things about your marriage, about your health, about your finance, about your sin nature, about the real things. You don't have to show it to anybody. Even, you know, if you and your spouse want to say, hey, you can share them or you can say, let's journal and we can share them at the end. I just want you to be able to have a real honest dialogue with God and chase some things that maybe you've never been able to catch and dare yourself to get into a scary position where if this doesn't happen for me, it's going to break my heart. I think that is true faith. That's stepping out of the boat. Three, I'll pray for these things daily and even hourly. I made this small originally so that prisoners could put it in their back pocket of their prison clothes. And I wanted to make it small or, you know, young people could put it in whatever. So, I mean, you carry it with you. But if you review your impossible prayers every day, then Uncle G starts seeing that this is important and you'll start noticing things that you have not noticed before. It's kind of like when you're in, I recently got a new car. And, you know, I researched it, tried to figure out what I want is, started looking online. And then guess what happened? Same thing that happens to you. You start seeing them all over town. All of a sudden, you start noticing that car. That's the one I want. And then all of a sudden, they're all around you, and you haven't seen them, but now all of a sudden, you do. That phenomenon is your brain finally deciding. Uncle G says, that's important to you. I'm going to start letting you notice the things that I've been blocking out that are not relevant for you. It's called the reticular activating system in the back of the primitive brain. It's in charge of weeding out things that you don't need and, and getting your attention to the things that you do. When you start reviewing your prayers and practicing these steps, your brain will get involved and you'll start noticing things you've been missing. And you'll find that you carry your prayers with you throughout the day instead of leaving them in your prayer closet. That makes sense? Okay, the next one is, I will take measurable steps toward my miracles every day. 
Okay, so if you do 10, I've got a thinking a whole lot more than that. You can see I've just got pages and pages and pages. They're just, I've got, I don't know how many I've got right now, probably, I don't know, 100, maybe something like that. And the ones that are circled are the ones that have come to pass. And so I, if you review it every day, and then all of a sudden it's the most fun when all of a sudden you go, oh, shoot, that one happened. And I didn't realize that you get to circle it and your faith grows because man, if he did that, and these are real specific. I've got lists for family, lists for health and character, lists for my ministry, resources. Just, I mean, I've gotten hooked on writing down the things that I'm pleading with God to show me, help me see them. And all of a sudden, I started noticing him everywhere. And I realized that I had been missing him. And I certainly had been missing the Holy Spirit and how he was trying to work in my life. So you, every one of the prayers that you're, that you're writing down and every day you're reviewing and you're talking to God about them, there is a measurable step that you can take. It can be as simple as sending a text. It can be do, doing something beautiful, making your spouse feel beautiful. It can be, you know, checking on a friend. It can be going to the doctor. It could be, you know, starting financial peace. I don't care. Whatever the area is, faith without deeds is dead. And I found that I was praying a bunch of things in the morning and just going out and forgetting about it and then wondering why doesn't he answer my prayers? And as far as I know, the answers were bumping into me in line. And I was like, hey, look out. And it's like God's literally sending prayers, answers into my path. I just had to be aware. Take measurable steps. Now, this is where it gets really cool. Five. I'll search and record miracle sightings and spiritual insights. This is where it got really cool. So it wasn't just like I'm on my knees, help me today. And I'm writing out my impossible prayers and reviewing them. And I'm carrying them with them through the day and I'm taking measurable steps. But here I added, I want to see you, Lord. Show me something today. I need a sign. And I started looking for signs. And sure enough, he did not disappoint me. And this is biblical. You can go back to Gideon. You can go different places where God does not mind when we ask him for confirmation. Show me something. Give me the idea. Help me find this. Discover this. Create this. Invent this. You know, help me meet that person. Help me find the right opportunity. Help me have the, the life-changing idea. And you go out and search for it. And when you see it, this can be so simple, is... I left space on, on every day with lines, and that's for you to journal. Now, if you don't like journaling, give it a shot. I mean, it doesn't have to be eloquent. It can just be, good morning, Lord. <laughs> I don't know what to write about because I'm not used to doing this. You know, I don't care. Just develop a dialogue that you begin to communicate again. And I'm not assuming that you're not. Don't ever take it like that. I'm not assuming you guys might all be in another stratosphere spiritually than me. But if somebody isn't, then maybe this will help. So write down little evidence. It can be, man, Bob called me. <laughs> and that might mean something as to one of your prayers. Or I had this idea. Or the letter arrived. Or I just got this text. And it was directly related to this prayer. And what that does is it creates a spiritual momentum where once you find a sign and see it and confirmation and circle one of your impossible prayers, and the reason I call them impossible is because I believe, you know, nothing's possible for me, but everything's possible for him. So certainly if I'm trying to break a stronghold, why in the world? I mean, they're, if they were possible, I'd already done it all by myself. So I just call them impossible prayers and that brings the miraculous into play. And then Here's where we get to, you know, there's always got to be repentance because every one of us is going to have a bad day, fall off the beam, do something stupid, give in again, whatever it is. And another thing I discovered along the way, both in the ministry and out, um, is I, I tend to have a guilty nature. You know what I'm saying? It has a lot to do with my childhood and kind of growing. I told you a little bit about, you know, the whole alcoholic thing going through my family and some different things that made for an insecure kid trying to figure out things that were hard to figure out. And it made for a real insecurity. And you don't have to be hard on me. You can ask my wife, I'll beat myself up. You know, I mean, I tend to in my nature, apart from him in my flesh, man, I've got a guilty nature. This one was important for me. Six, when I'm wrong, I'll promptly admit it. And I'll quickly make amends. Simple. 
I tried to make it less dramatic. I mean, because I remember back in the day, man, I'd mess up and it's like, your heart's beating. Oh, man, I got to call my boss and tell him. And, you know, I'm just, oh, God's mad at me. And golly, I hope I don't die right now. And just all this drama that's not even biblical. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying don't have people in your life that you're open with. We need, but there's a lot of times where simple repentance is all we need. We don't need to carry it to the next day, the next day, and all of a sudden you're guilty, and then all the, the enemy is in your kitchen. It's like, mm -mm. if we repent quickly, all it does is when I sin, this is my conviction, he doesn't stop working for me or around me and through me. It's that my eyes get covered up again because I'm focused on me and what I did wrong. The quicker I repent, if you need to phone a friend, phone a friend. If you don't, don't. It just turn around and get your eyes on him again, and you'll find yourself growing through areas that maybe had jammed you up. Let's make repentance, you know, quick and painless if possible. Forgive me, help me again, and boom, get back on track, and you'll find that maybe, you know, there's less drama than we believe there is. And last, and this is huge, I'll deal with my doubts, excuses, and complaints faithfully and diligently, and I'll choose gratitude instead. Gratitude is a powerful elixir, if you will. It's like, if I'm fearful, gratitude, and the fear has no place to be. If I'm guilty, gratitude replaces it. They can't occupy the same space. If I'm angry, gratitude. I mean, gratitude is such a powerful emotion, but it's more than an emotion. It's like, man, I am grateful. You show me the most grateful person on this call, and I'll show you a joyful person. I'll show you a peaceful person. I'll show you a humble person, and I'll show you a fruitful person. I mean, gratitude is so powerful. I think it's the fertile soil where miracles grow. And so gratitude, when you catch yourself making excuses, replace it with gratitude. When you catch doubting, you know, it's like, I don't know if he's going to do this for me. He does it for other people, not for me. He don't like me. He loves me because he has to. He doesn't like me much. Replace it with gratitude. You know, when you find yourself complaining, even if it's not out loud, shoot, I'll complain in my head, maybe more than I do out loud. Catch it. You know, Paul says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus. Every thought, if you start to pay attention to what's going on, Uncle G, he's always talking, then you can start catching things, replace it with gratitude. So to put it all together, it's so, it's so simple. Once you get into the rhythm, roll out of your bed, say, good morning, please help me run to the bathroom, do whatever quiet time you do. But I would in, instill this, review the steps. They'll become a little more second nature. Review your impossible prayers, add to them as the spirit prompts you. Do the Day one, some of y'all might have started day one on Sunday. Some of y'all might start day one tomorrow. It's cool. I mean, either way is all right. But next Wednesday, we will do the discussion question on the first week. Okay, so you've got a, a miracle story or passage every day of the 40 days. And then you've got a commentary that I try to kind of spur your thinking, maybe see it from a different perspective, a little place to journal, and then go do your thing and go look for your miracle. And then the next day, it's day two, the passage, the commentary, a little bit of journaling, look for evidence, move to the next phase, okay? It's, it's not that complicated. And then prayerfully, you'll be circling them along the way. Um, repetition is key. It's like whatever Uncle G does a lot, he gets very, very good at. That can be worrying, <laughs> it's not necessarily a good thing if you worry all the time. And I give way to that. I mean, you can ask my wife, this has been a challenging little stretch, man, where I'm having to deal with anxiety, which is just part of my brain chemistry. Maybe some of you share that. And it's got, I mean, it's it's like the, the gratitude is a very powerful thing, but really it, I need routines. And the more that I repeat a thing, the more that I get good at it. And if I can get good at worrying, and that's the first place Uncle G goes, it's because I've trained him to worry a lot, all right? And there's actually brain chemistry that happens when I worry. Cortisol, stress hormone, norepinephrine, these things, these stress hormones that raise your heart rate, 
your blood pressure goes up, your sweat glands overproduce, your stomach starts to produce acid. Stress and anxiety do a lot of chemistry. And believe it or not, a habit of worry affects our health. So this is really about our health as well. And so these steps are designed to help you to break through some of these things. Okay, one more thing, and then I'm going to get into the evidence. And uh, well, let me say this first. Each week, we're going to study one of the questions that Jesus asked people. All right. And so Jesus asked a lot of questions. A lot of times we look at the miracle, we look at the teaching, and we miss the question. So I've got five questions that I picked out in the Gospels. When Jesus asked the question, it revealed the heart. All right. You ask like an attorney, a good lawyer, say, where were you on July the 27th? They know where you were on July the 27th. They want to hear what you have to say. And in the same way, Jesus asks questions, and then what comes out exposes the heart. And so we're going to do that as our discussion question each week, and I think you're going to love it, and then we'll have Q&A. Tonight is more of an intro, okay? Um, please journal if you would. All right, I'm going to read a scripture, and then I'm going to go into some fascinating pictures of some of my dear friends along the way. You'll know this, but just listen to it like you never heard it before. It's in Ephesians chapter three, Paul's beautiful prayer. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the father from whom every family on heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, here it is right here. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. There's so much in that. I mean, Paul is, is pouring his heart out and he's saying, do you understand how much he loves us? How high and deep and wide and long and just, I mean, he's surrounded in us. His love is inescapable. I told you on Sunday that I fell in love with the divine stalker who would not let me go. I tried to get away. I shook my fist and said, leave me alone. And he basically said no. And all the suffering that I went through, I brought it on me. But he never, ever, 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 ever left me. He chased me. And that is what Paul's trying to say. But then he says, and there's power that's used throughout that. He talks about his power, the power that's in you. And that is the Holy Spirit. I mean, he is the power. And when I get burned out, tired, worried, faithless, it's because I am no longer relying on the power that I have at my disposal. He hasn't lost any of his power. I am disregarding it, ignoring it. I'm preaching to myself right now because <laughs> I know, I know that I know that I know that that power is in me. I just have to learn how to tap into it. But then he says the part that now I told you I wasn't going to preach about things that I haven't experienced. I used to, and it wasn't like I was I was being a hypocrite. It, I was just, I was good at reading the Bible and figuring out how to tell stories and teach it in an entertaining and inspiring way. And I used all of it, you know what I'm saying? But then I started after this reawakening and this journey that I've been on, I started realizing that there were there were passages that I had never experienced. This is one of them. He says, to him who is able to immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, that's what this 40 days is all about, is saying, I need you to do for me what I can't do for myself. And I'm going to ask for some things that scare me a little bit, but you promise me that you can do immeasurably more. And I thought, man, I want to experience that. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story, and then I'm going to close out with these slides. So, right. and I'm going to share my screen in a second. So hopefully that will work. Um so Terry and I, we, uh, during the pandemic, you know, we can work from wherever and uh, if we have to. And so we did. And we had this little beach place down in Panama City Beach. And we would uh, we'd go down there from time to time. It was a little place. It needed a lot of work. It was kind of coming apart. 
And so we said, let's just go to the beach and, and we can just live down there for a minute and we'll, we'll do the quarantine on the beach. And so we went down there and it was, and we ended up renovating it and staying down there for a while. And it was, turned out to be a lifesaver. And we didn't even know it, but that season became one of the toughest seasons of our lives. Our kids were going through some things that were scary for us. And I'm telling you, that beach walk saved us, especially me. I mean, you know, Terry was in a place where she was she was more faithful than me in a lot of areas. And, and I was just trying to hang on. And that beach became my refuge. And I would walk for miles. We, we both, we walked together. But in the morning, I'd get up and I'd go on my prayer walk and I'd take my little 40 days of prayer. And I would just cry and I would beg and I'd walk miles on that beach. And at this point, you know, I was well into this process. So I would ask for signs. And sometimes I'd be like, Lord, you got to give me one today. Like I, I need a sign. Well, one of the little ways I started doing it is this beach doesn't have shells. I mean, there's hardly ever any shells. And so I'd be like, just give me a shell. I mean, just a real, a pretty shell would show me a little something. And some of this might sound goofy to you, but <laughs> so I do my thing. I'm kind of childlike in that way. I like playing games and he seems to like to play too. And so I'd be walking along and all of a sudden I'd say, oh, there it is. And I'd just say, thank you. And then I'd start praying again. And it became kind of my thing. Well, I would walk about a mile down the beach and there was a big orange um, kind of fence that wouldn't let you go further because they were doing some kind of um, uh, environmental restoration project up on the, you know, that end of the beach by the rocks. And so nobody ever went up there during this long stretch. And so I, one day, man, I am just like really, really, really desperate. And I'm like, you got to show me something. And I walk all the way to that and I am, there's nothing. And I get to that partition and the wind had blown it down. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess, I guess I can keep going. And so, you know, I tend to kind of be a little bit like that sometimes. So anyway, I just kept walking and I just kept praying, kept praying. It's like, give me a sign, give me a sign. And I get all the way down to a place I'd never been before. And ain't nobody down there because nobody else is breaking the rules, but me. And all of a sudden I look down and there's this beautiful shell. And I was like, oh, and it was one of these spiral shells. And I looked at it and I praised God for it. And I said, man, I've got hope. And all of a sudden I looked down and I was like, there's another one. And so I get that one. And then I walk a little further and I'm like, dang, there's two more. And so I put them in my pocket and I get all my pockets filled up. And finally I couldn't hold anymore. And they're just like, they're everywhere. So I walk a mile back and I go to our little place. I said, baby, give me a shopping bag. And so I walk all the way down, walk another mile all the way down the beach. And I start picking up shells and I start filling bags and I'm walking back for, you know, another mile. And then I get another bag. This happened for three days. And I'm just like, I'm gathering shells. And every day it was a different kind of shell. And some of you might be thinking it was because of that restoration project. And I'm like, who cares? It was the timing of it. See, that's the thing. We can explain away miracles, but you can't explain the timing of it. God has everything under his control. And so <laughs> there were all these shells. And I'm going to show you the this. shells. Say again. Can I show them the shells? No, it's on the next slide, baby doll. Okay. All right. I didn't realize you had a slide. Sorry you always, about that. You always got my back though, babe. That's what I appreciate. <laughs> well, I'm at home and you can see the real thing instead of the slide. Oh, uh, well, I got you. You know, yeah. But, right. but show the slide. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the, I'll, I'll tell you this before I show you. So I'm walking back on the third day and I'm telling you, I'm getting a workout every day. And all of a sudden there's this beautiful older couple. They haven't even gotten to the orange thing yet. And they're, they're looking for shells. They got nothing. And I got these two bags. And so I felt kind of like the, the brothers who came across the Midian camp that had already been, you know, whatever. And they found all the plunder and they felt bad and said, Oh, we got to call our brothers. And so I felt like that. So I walked over this couple and I said, uh, ma'am, I said, <laughs> I opened the bag and she's like, where'd you get those? And I said, keep walking. And so next day I went out there and there's all kinds of people out there and all the shells are gone. So, all right, let's try this. See if it works, James. All right. And we're going to do this. And then I'm going to move this. Hang with me there, people. Slideshow and play. All right, there we go. All right. 
Uh oh. Here we go. So to him who's able to do immeasurably more, this last part is going to be, I'm going to show you what God can do. Are you ready? There are my shells. <laughs> when I say there are no shells on this beach, I am not lying. And we've got two huge canisters of them. And that was just the top of what we found. So anyway, that sets up for what I'm going to show you. I told you when I prayed that prayer, I said, if you ever let me preach the word again, then I'll go to those who nobody wants to go to. And I said, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the stranger, the sick, and the prisoner. And Jesus called them the least of these. I had preached a lot about Matthew 25 and the least of these, but once again, I had never really done it much. And this is when my life began to change. This is a kingdom kid that was a friend of mine, little, little, little brother to me. He's about 13 in that picture, bigger than a lot of the kids. Just look at his smile. And he was in desperate trouble. And his mom called me 10 years after I'd mentored him. And he was facing a serious charge for his life. That's him today. He's about three years away from coming home. But God used Luis, my little brother in the church that I was leading, all grown up, who had become a gang leader for MS-13. And he was on trial for his life. And that is how God got me into this ministry. He's coming home in a few years. I will be waiting for him. I mean, he's my brother. But what that led me to was going into my first prison. The first guy I ever met was this guy. They call him Sir Brown. He's a legend. He's a, what they call a chain gang legend. And God put him on the bleachers right next to me the first time I ever went into the worst prison in the state of Georgia. He not only became my friend, he prophesied this thing. He said, bro, he didn't even know me hardly at all. He said, you're going to take this thing all over the world. And I said, <laughs> I don't know what in the heck's gotten into you, but you don't know where I'm at in my life. See, at this point, I was just a fallen preacher that was trying to find his voice and walked into a prison to serve. And God gave me one of the best yeah. friends of my life. He's, he's a brother to me. He's doing life without. And so they say he's never going to come home, but we're praying for a miracle on that. The movement started in this prison on the day that I was able to baptize eight guys after I've been working with them for, you know, a good long minute. And this guy's name is Dre, and he's a high-ranking gangster disciple at this point, and he wants to change his life. And he sets off on this journey, and he says, bro, I'm ready. He goes to his gang. He, he respectfully says, man, you guys got to set me free. And he had the kind of rank where they allowed him to without doing what they usually do. And he became the young voice of this movement. And that was the day that the first, you know, eight brothers were baptized. They became my church. I didn't really have a church at this point. I mean, I was out there and Terry and I were, were doing our thing. And we're trying to get through this hard time in life. I was sober, got sobered in 05. This happened in 2010. And all of a sudden, my church became this little group of brothers on the chain gang in this maximum security prison. That led to, there was a war that broke out after peace came to that prison. And those brothers helped me put together what became the Power Peace Project, which is a program that brings rival gangs together in prisons 40 days at a time and teaches them how to resolve conflict, work together, earn better time. This is Michigan. And I was invited. I, I took it there. These are rivals. And they've spent 40 days together going through and studying the great peacemakers of, of history. And this is the celebration where we have. And it started this thing, which then spread to Ohio. In the same way that you guys are going to take this 40-day pledge, the prayer pledge, these brothers, this is the day that they take their 40-day pledge of nonviolence, that for 40 days in a row, they're going to seek first to understand their enemy. They're going to find common ground with their rival. They're going to walk a mile with their adversary before they judge them. They're going to actively listen, compassionately communicate, win wrong, promptly admit it, make it right, and treat one another with dignity and respect, something that's unheard of on chain gang. And yet these brothers, this is when we kick it off, and it's kind of like a power move, and somebody captured it. That's in Ohio. This is where we came up with the slogan, hope is the new dope. Now, these guys, I mean, good Lord, you have, you have Muslims, you've got the Latin brothers, those gangs, we got the Aryan brothers, you know, the, the guy all the way over here on the right, his name is Stan. He's the probably the most spiritual person I've ever known, whether we're talking about in prison behind the wire or in the free world, he's a beast. I mean, he's a much more spiritual man than me. And he just got out after 33 years, went in at 17, came out at 51. 
And these are some of the great heroes of my life, although I totally understand they've hurt a lot of people, but God calls us to go and visit with them because they all have unique stories. That led me to Nebraska, or Kansas, and this is where we're kicking off, and look where I'm preaching. I'm preaching about the eight brothers that started the thing, and now they're starting to call it a movement, and it's going from one prison to another, and the guys are fired up when it gets there, and we're, we're realizing that we're on to something. Peace is coming to the prisons that we're operating, and the brothers behind the wire are doing all the heavy lifting, so we took it across the border to Nebraska, and this is a 40 days of prayer celebration, okay? Now, look who the happiest person in that picture is i get kind of excited about this stuff but these these beautiful sisters they took the same challenge that you're taking this 40 days of prayer and this is when we had the celebration they get their certificates this was in nebraska in the middle of the winter it's snowy and the warden called me and said hey we want to surprise the ladies and have you come back for the graduation i was like bet and so i went there they it's hard to sneak a six four you know big old guy through the snow in a prison yard without anybody seeing, but somehow they snuck me in and got me into the uh, chapel and they sequestered me in a room back behind the, the stage and all the ladies came in and I was just like, I hope this worked. I hope somebody had an answered prayer and they start sharing. The chaplain has them share about their miracle prayers. And I sat there and listened and I began to cry because sisters got up and they said, you know, my father has diabetes and he lost his sight and I can't be there to take care of him. So one of my impossible prayers was that he would get his sight back and he can see again. <laughs> and everybody's like cheering. One sister stood up and she said, all 10 of my impossible prayers have been answered. And that's why they're so joyful is this is stuff that the prisoners don't get. And so if they can find miracles, why would they be able to find miracles and not you and me? because they're hungry, they're desperate, they don't have the things that we have, and there's a reason that God tells us to go and spend time with the least of these, because they will transform you. We're going to spend a whole night on them. All right, this is when we took it to the youth. I'm kind of going down the home stretch here. Went to juvenile prisons in Ohio. Those are two rival gangs. They beef all the time. It's the, the heartless felons and the HBs, and they fight on site, and that's why I was brought in. After 40 days, not only were they together, but the two gang leaders became best friends and peace came to that prison because these brothers, look at that, that, that you got 12, 13 year olds have to deal with that guy. And <laughs> these are two brilliant brothers, but they just, they were ops. They were always fighting, but they got at the same table. Part of our process is every week, the rivals get together at their table and they go through the curriculum. They became best friends. Once that happened, the fighting stopped. It's not that complicated really. And then I got asked to go to a real gangster party. And so one of the brothers on the inside called me on an illegal cell phone, which I didn't tell him to do, and told me to show up at this place down on the west end of Atlanta. And I showed up and it was rival gangs, Crips, Bloods, Gangster Disciples, Moors, and Nation of Islam. And they were coming together for solidarity around police brutality. And I was the special guest. <laughs> and so they, I don't know if this thing is affecting your ability to be able to see what I'm showing. Um, but anyway, that was, they started marching and I was like, they want, you want to march with us? I was like, sure. And then they started yelling things that I can't say on this um, fine program here. And I had to bounce. But anyway, it was quite a, people will come together for a common purpose. Took it to Ukraine. That was pretty trippy, kind of in former Soviet Union prisons. That guy's the colonel. He tried, kept trying to get me to drink vodka. And I'd be like, no, I'm good. And he'd say, vodka. And I'd say, no, really, I'm straight. And he'd go, vodka. And I'm like, look, if I drink vodka, I probably won't leave. And so finally, we settled on chocolate and coffee. Took it to South Africa, and we danced. These are Zulu brothers. And we danced, and we sang. And there's a whole another miracle about how in the world that happened. But that would be for another time. Took it to Honduran prisons, and they only have guards back there. He just kind of let you go in there and hope that everybody respects you and treats you nice. And these guys did because I practiced the principles. And see, I've found that if you become the other, and this is going to be one of our lessons, Paul said, I've become all things to all men that I might win some. And I have seen miracles around the world practicing that principle. Walk where they walk, see where they live, go into their rooms and cells, walk with them. And you'll find miracles and dangerous men will not be dangerous around you. And I think that's how Jesus did it. That's a prison in Tijuana, 2008, 5,000 
uh, men took over that prison and held it for 30 days and they set it on fire. I know the brother that set the fire. He's actually a pretty good dude. But they took it and held it for 30 days and they had to bring tanks in, federales, to take it back. And so what did we do? I don't know how I got invited in. That's in Tijuana, Mexico. We did our program with 50 men and that's their graduation ceremony. There was joy. We sang. They ate pizza in a place where they'd never get that. We gave them candy. We played games in the yard. I mean, it was the most fun. Over 40 days. And some of those guys, you know, say, I mean, cartels run that prison and chances are pretty dang good that, you know, a lot, if not most of those guys are cartel guys. But when you get close enough to them, you see them and it's hard to judge and hate up close. That happens at a distance because you find that there's honor in these places. If you treat a man with respect, he'll respect you back. If you treat a man like an animal, he will bite you. And then it came to the kids. This is a soccer team I worked with. That's a prison. We're getting ready to go in and play a soccer match against a bunch of prisoners. That was a pretty cool day. And now I'm going to close out with my friend Marquez. This is a kid that I met in the, um, the YDC, the Youth Detention Center here in the state of Georgia. I partnered with the, the Department of Juvenile Justice. This is the one of the most influential kids that came through because when he got there, man, nobody messed with him. And usually, you know, you get beat when you come into this prison and they didn't, they treated him with respect. And I had to work real hard to win his respect. But finally I did. And he became my friend. And one day we were standing out in the yard and I looked at him and I said, Marquez, what do you want to do, man? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, when you get out, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to be like you. I want to do what you do. And I said, what's that? And he said, I want to be a motivational speaker. And I was like, I am not a motivational speaker. <laughs> However, you know, I asked him, I said, have you ever been a hero? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, on the streets, have you ever been a hero? And he said, yes, proudly. And I said, well, you're going to have to tap into your hero because what you're getting ready to try to do, because he had done, you know, he hit the streets when he was 12. His mom was 14. When she had him, he joined the gang at 13. He was in and out of the system. He's a, he's a young gang leader. And that kid, he hit me up when he got back to the free world. And that this young man over the last year has been probably the best mentee I've ever had. I'm talking about young dudes that I disciple back in the day. He does what he says he's going to do. He keeps his word. He comes to see me two hours to get his teaching and training. And I trust him with my life. I mean, he's my little brother. He came over to dinner with his mom and his fiance and got to meet Terry. And we got to have them in our home. And, and this is a kid that was a dangerous young man. And God is showing me that there are miracles. Took it to the schools, took it to the police, pop for cops, took it to Selma, Alabama. And those are the little kids that stole my heart. And so I say all that to say that God is most certainly able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. All I'm, my time is up. All I'm asking you to do is start believing bigger. Pray about some things you've given up on. Pray about some things that scare you. When you write it down, it will become real to you. Get it out of your head and on paper where you can see it. If you need a miracle in your marriage, write it down and start looking for things you haven't seen in your spouse. If you need a miracle for one of your kids, if you need a miracle recovery, if you need a miracle bailout, whatever it is, man, write it down. It ought to make you a little nervous to write it down. And I'm going to dare you to risk getting a broken heart because you're going to get to a place where you're asking for things that you haven't asked for. I pray that, that this ride is going to be a miracle journey for you. Every time I do it, it helps me. You guys are going to change my life. And over the next month or so, Terry and I are going to keep our promise and we're going to come and see you. And we're going to get to do, you know, the, the little program event that we were going to do. James, I'm going to throw it back to you, brother. Thank you for giving me 50 minutes of your time, and I appreciate you. All right. Wow. Thank you, uh, Kit. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for sharing um, what God has done with a little bit of faith and um, 
I, I appreciate the call. I, I added this in the chat. I am reevaluating my impossible prayers that I've already written down. I like the idea of stretching that and um, thinking through. I, I, I'm afraid of the sentence, risk getting a broken heart. Um, but I think it's a good fear. So I appreciate that. I'll put you on that some more. But uh, great pictures, really inspiring. I'm going to look for shells on the streets of Pittsburgh and see what I can find. <laughs> Just kidding. But uh, I'll uh, I'll see what the equivalent might be here. Amen. But uh, yeah, I appreciate it so much. Looking forward to uh, to everything. Uh, just so this group knows one more time, in case you weren't here, but this was recorded and we'll put it on uh, YouTube and uh, send that out to you guys. And we'll be back again, 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. sharp. We'll be here for part two. And so if you haven't started the book, if you didn't start on Monday, tomorrow, day one, get it going. Um, first thing in the morning, get on your knees and pray. We'll we'll close here. It seems appropriate to close with some prayer. Um, and uh, then we'll we'll call it a night. And feel free to, if anyone wants to stay on and, and fellowship, we'll leave the, uh, the room open here. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and, and bow our heads in prayer. Actually, I'm going to put... Um, Josiah on the spot. Josiah Saunders, do you mind closing us in a word of prayer? All right, I can do that. God, thank you so much for this time, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to get together to hear this message on prayer and really faith, Lord. Um, you have done amazing miracles, Lord, that we can see in the Bible we can see um, if we really open ourselves up to the word in that sense. But God, your miracles are not stretched to only then, Lord, that they are for now as well. And there's an opportunity here to, to see you do incredible things in the lives of ourselves, but also the lives of others, Lord. I pray that you stretch our hearts, stretch our faith to pray impossible prayers in our sense and see you do the impossible lord uh, i pray for this kickoff i pray that we can dive into it with gusto and fervor and and see how you deliver lord and we keep our eyes open to that lord pray for the rest of this night pray for um the rest of these discussions as well lord in jesus name i pray amen Amen. Hey, James, can I get a, I need to get a picture of the family. All right. So my thing is peace signs. So everybody's got to do a little peace out. And I'm going to tell the whole world that Pittsburgh is, is busting out ready. I'm going to go one, two, three. I got you. All right. I'm going to miss you until I see you again. We love you guys. See you next week. Bye. Thanks again. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Goodbye. Uh, well, we've got just a, just a few. We're proud. <laughs> hey, Grandma Sandy. Oh, uh, you are muted. Tiger. I didn't know I was still in the mix. You are. <laughs> so, how many? How what is it uh, like 22 of us still uh, on the call no yeah. there's only five no it's, it, i saw 22 on the chat that's all but anyway uh -huh.
Yeah, there were a lot. There were a lot of people on today. I don't um, know the exact number, but there were definitely. Yeah. 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 Uh, boy, does he give us a lot of meaty stuff to <laughs> to mull over yeah. at every level. Good stuff. It was good. Yeah, real good, good stuff. And how how are you uh, two old married uh, folks? <laughs> <laughs> we are Doing good great. yeah round out year one <laughs> <laughs> how about that it has been exactly how long almost yeah. exactly a year a year ten, and ten, ten days, days. days almost exactly wow so mm -hmm. and uh and a lot of uh you know adventures in the years ahead <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> indeed Discover discoveries yes yeah yeah, yeah. Doing by good. the way are you you all i i know that you're a, an amazing cook linnea and uh, sam does some things too yeah yes. sam is a great cook especially uh things he does especially seems like uh sam that you do uh you like to do exotic dishes <laughs> is that right i have i have uh on occasion tried some some interesting things yeah 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 and i would say bread's not that exotic and i've probably spent more well, time no no that's not one of them <laughs> did you have something specific in mind no no i i uh, i love actually i could uh, 24 7 do asian food oh, yeah. all, all kinds of asian you know uh, you yeah, name it and i add, i'd be willing to try it but anyway you made pad thai for the um for dave and danielle i don't think so yeah <laughs> okay that might yeah. be what you're about <laughs> That's uh, yeah, pad thai is uh, is one of the favorites, and it can be done really well, and it can be a disappointment. Uh, you're right. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> I mean, yeah, but yeah. Um, when it, when it's done right, it's really good, really yummy. Yeah. So, yeah. right now, Miss, Mr. David is is on deployment. You may know his, you know, going into the. Claims adjusting business. Oh, wow. Okay, what so state? Is he he's uh, in uh, Detroit, and he's going to be gone for as much as maybe just a little more than a month. Oh, that's oh wow, about. yeah, wow. So this is a talk about uh, you know breaking through to new uh, <laughs> new ground. Uh, this is it for him. Yeah, the claims adjusting, I remember he, he was pretty excited about it. I didn't think that the trips were that long, though. Just well, the... yeah, it depends on the kind of deployment, because this is, there were hurricanes in the, the Detroit area and really devastation. But there are so many things going on now, I swear. Mm. Uh, you know, we've got hurricanes, of course. We've had a few of them. And the latest one, uh, is that uh, not Eve? What was it? Anyway, Ida, Ida, no, not Ida, but that was one of them. Um, but anyway, I, I, I'm not sure if you're believers in the climate change oh, thing. Yeah. But I definitely am. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And and it, and they um, also had that uh, six point eight earthquake in Morocco. Did oh, you hear yeah. about that? And like almost three thousand people killed, and about five thousand injured. Wow! And um, then uh, dams breaking in Libya, <laughs> and uh, a lot of people, you know, lost right. their lives. Yeah. But uh, but the wildfires, everything, you know, things are starting earlier and lasting longer, and <laughs> um. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's just, it's crazy. Yep, and uh, yeah. I mean we're we should consider ourselves lucky to yes 
and just have some extra clouds, you know? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're just in competition with Seattle, Washington. And San Francisco. And, <laughs> yeah, we were we went to San Fran and uh, 